This is a Hot Pie Original. The Meyer Chronicles, take one. Welcome to The Meyer Chronicles, a Hot Pie Media production. For more information about The Meyer Chronicles, go to hotpiemedia.com. In this episode, Andy Meyer and producer John Rubin discuss Andy's career move from music to movies. Hey again, Andy. Great to be here. Good to see you, John. Another fun podcast. I'm excited. You know, I think they're getting better and better only because, you know, we're working together more and the topics keep changing and are fresh. I mean, when you're talking about The Breakfast Club, that's a really interesting story of a movie that came together right away. And then you talk about Fried Green Tomatoes. It was the hardest movie I ever had to do. And it was like five years. And now we're talking about, you know, music and back to movies. It's, it's fantastic. Your resume in the entertainment field is really varied. So it's, it allows us to talk about some pretty cool stuff. And the last podcast, of course, was the music business in the 70s, A&M Records, the sort of, you know, the stories you had were amazing with all those great artists, George Harrison, Joe Cocker, Peter Frampton. And when we ended that podcast, you know, you said you were, you were burnt out doing PR for A&M. You had, done, you had put in a lot of hours and a lot of years, and you decided to travel the world. You were telling us you decided to travel the world at age 25, and to your shock, your bosses not only did they embrace the idea, they helped pay for it. How'd that happen? I had made a promise to myself that I would work in the corporate world for five years and no more because I didn't want to see the world when I was, you know, 80 on a tour somewhere. So I went to Herb Alpert and Jerry Moss. In retrospect, it was a pretty bold move. I was an employee working for him, and I said, I need a year sabbatical off. I was 25 years old. And I said, I, I, need, I need a year to travel the world. And they were so happy for me and kind of jealous, I think, because they couldn't do it, that they bought me an around the world ticket for any cotton I want to go to any time for a year for $2,500. And the trip was also my not very mature way of having the conversation with my girlfriend that I wanted to break up. So <laughs> I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm going away for a year. And that, she sort of got the message, I think, uh, from that. Uh, not my proudest moment, by the way. So I got my backpack on. I carried a typewriter with me that with carbon paper, everybody will now be Googling what's carbon paper. And I, you know, headed off to Tahiti. And the idea of the carbon paper was I was going to write letters to my friends and keep a copy of it. And that would be my kind of diary because mm -hmm. I don't like to write to myself. And I did that, and I still have those letters, and a lot of them are the basis for the book that I'm writing, The Meyer Chronicles. And carbon paper, I remember it had that weird blue, like, thick ink. Is that st you still have that in good condition, those letters? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And that smell, you know, <laughs> it, that carbon paper smell was always right, right. distinctive. So what countries did you visit? What were you doing? And how long were you gone for? I was gone almost a year. I went uh, all through Asia, India, Singapore, New Zealand. Oh, wow. I caught malaria in India, ended up in a YMCA hostel for a while. I went to Singapore, Thailand, the Golden Triangle. You know, this is the 70s and I was 25. I went into a hash house and came out three days later. I don't <laughs> quite re remember what happened. That sounds like the rock and roll podcast we did last time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it sounds like my whole life in the record business. Right. <laughs> so... Then I was in Israel, and I got a telegram from Jerry Moss of a and Records. He said, come on back. I've got work for you to do. And the timing was right because I had an idea, a big idea for the company. Because when I was in Europe and I was looking at the explosion of the, all the soundtracks and everything, and all the studios were giving those soundtracks, Saturday Night Fever, for example, mm -hmm. to their record company. So Warner Brothers Film would give it to Warner Brothers Records. a and Records didn't have a film company. So they couldn't create films and then give the soundtracks to A&M Records. So I came up with the idea that they ought to be in the film business. So when I was flying back, that's what I was thinking about. So you come back to them, I guess this is probably 1976, 77, yeah, Saturday Night Fever. There's a Grease. I mean, this was a major time for soundtracks. I see exactly mm -hmm. your logic here. And what did they say? Did they agree this was something they were missing out on? They thought it was an interesting idea. And they said, why don't you bring us some executives from the film world Let's talk to them and see if we can come up with a concept. And I did. I called a few people I knew who were film executives and asked them to come over. And by the third interview, they called me in 
And they said, look, we don't know anything about the movie business. We don't know these guys you're bringing us. We know we're going to get screwed in the movie business. Why don't you run the company? And then when we get screwed, you can at least tell us how we got screwed. With these guys you brought in, we'll never know what happened. So are they effectively asking you to run the company at this point? Yeah, I was a 26-year-old English major, and they asked me to run a major film studio. Right. And you had never, you've been to the movies before, but that was probably about it, right? <laughs> uh, I, I know how to watch a movie. I, I can go it's into a, a scene and watch a movie. <laughs> um, I'd never read a script. I'd never been on a movie right. set. Part of my life and everybody's is adapt and survive. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. when I started at AM Records in the music business, I didn't know anything about the record business. And now I'm in the film business and I know anything about the <laughs> film business. So ignorance is bliss, I think. Uh, well, they gave you this amazing opportunity. Now, now you're running AM films. I know it's about the very early 80s here. I guess 1981, you guys opened your doors. Yeah. But now you have to find, you have to find scripts to develop, movies to make. And the first movie that a and Films ever releases uh, at the end of 1984 is a movie called Birdie, which was also a book originally. And I found that book wandering around in a bookstore. And I read it just for my own personal enjoyment. And then I checked on the rights and I saw the rights were available. And then I sort of checked on what was happening with the book. And I found out everybody in town had passed on it. You know, just a little trivia. By the time a book gets in a bookstore, if if it's popular, the whole town has already seen it in in manuscript form and passed Mm -hmm. on it. So it's rare that you can walk into a store and pick up a book that the rights haven't been either passed on or bought if it's creative content for movies. So this is what I thought. This is the English major in me talking. I said, this is a really interesting book. It had a similar structure if you heard the Fried Green podcast of there being a present day frame and a past and you're going back and forth, which is kind of tricky to pull off properly. But I thought it was an interesting challenge. I didn't do any marketing I didn't ask anybody's advice. I didn't do any data mining or research stuff I probably would be doing now when I'm looking at a project. And I went to Herb and Jerry and I said, I want to take a shot with this book, but I don't want to spend too much money because it's a kind of a weird book. I mean, Matt Modine has sex with a bird halfway through the book. You know what I mean? So it, it's, it's not like it's a franchise. So I said... <laughs> Let me just hire two writers at Writers Guild minimum. At that time, it was like 25 grand. And mm-hmm. let, me, let me just play around with it a little bit. And that's what we did. And I hired Jack Bear and Sandy Krupp, two really cool guys, but they'd never produced any movies or written any movies. They were screenwriters who hadn't been produced. And we went to work and we came up with a script that I thought was really good. What happens next at this point? I thought it was good. And fortunately, our agent, CAA, the agent representing the company, also represented a legendary director named Alan Parker. Mm. who made The Commitments, Midnight Express, Evita. He sort of came from the world of commercials like Ridley Scott. They were sort of peers. Mm -hmm. And CAA gave the script to him, and he liked it, and he committed to it right away. And this is the first script I ever developed. So so you're you're batting one, you're batting a thousand right now. (laughs) Yeah, I I mean, and, and once you have a director like Alan Parker, it becomes relatively easy to get the money. And it wasn't a lot of money. And so we made a deal with TriStar Pictures for $12 million. And I had my first picture in production just as we opened the doors. And was William Wharton, the author of the book, was he involved in any of this? I should have asked you, was he involved in any of this once it was adapted? No, but we became quite good friends. I also adapted another book of his called Midnight Clear, Mm -hmm. which was made into a movie with Ethan Hawke. But we didn't involve him. It's generally not a good idea to have an author involved in the making of a film because they're so precious about their material. And we made a big change that we didn't tell him about. We changed the war from World War II to Vietnam, so it would be sort of closer to the young people in the audience. And when I brought William Wharton to the set in Philadelphia, he was walking around saying, these cars are wrong, these (laughs) telephone wires wouldn't be there. And I said, oh, we changed it to Vietnam. He said, oh, 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 okay. Why is everybody wearing tie-dye shirts? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's funny, actually. I didn't know that. Well, you think about the late 80s was all Vietnam movies, you know, Full Metal Jacket and Platoon. So I guess that they made more sense to do that. Another thing about Birdie that a lot of people may not know or remember is that Peter Gabriel, he did the soundtrack for that, right? Not only did he do the soundtrack, he got the picture really late and he did it in his apartment in like a weekend, which is really amazing. (laughs) Did he have like the nylon thing over his head when he was singing or we don't know? (laughs) No, we don't know. (laughs) From Genesis? (laughs) 
Now, I remember when I think of the movie Birdie, aside from his relationship with the bird, I remember some amazing scenes where he's, he's flying. What's the technology on that? How did this happen? Well, this was early 80s, and Perta, the bird, is a major character in the movie. In the book, mm-hmm. Perta has her own chapters of her relationship with Matt Modine. And a lot of it is fantasy of her flying around. And we had to figure out a way to sort of show that part of the story. At that time, the technology wasn't really there to do that. So we had to go outside of sort of the traditional film world. And we went to Garrett Brown, who invented the Skycam. And the Skycam you all see from sports and everything. And he designed a way using that equipment to show that kind of flying sequence, which really came off really well. And that's the first time a sky cam was ever used in a film. And Nicolas Cage, Francis Ford Coppola's uh, nephew, uh, he was up and coming. What was it like having him in this movie? Well, he was very young and it was interesting and very committed to his craft, I have to say. He arrived on the set the first day with his head wrapped in bandages, which is how he would be when we shoot the movie. He's injured in Vietnam. And the first scene, he's, his head's covered in bandages. And we said, what happened? He said, well, I pulled my wisdom teeth out so my face would look like it's supposed to in the movie. <laughs> uh, he said, I'm method. And we said, you know, we have makeup people who can do that. You don't have to pull your own wisdom teeth out. He was a devoted actor, let's, let's just say. Don't worry, Bertie, they can't make me leave you. can't go out there. I couldn't make it. What about the actual process when you guys were filming Birdie? Now that it's A&M Films' first movie, did you feel like we have something, is it still weird, this film that we have on our hands, or was it coming together for you as you were watching it unfold? So, you know, I was feeling very good about the company because that was a window, you know, as we talk more today, where we were making a bunch of movies at the same time, and it was kind of a whirlwind. It was pretty exciting. Was there a big premiere or, you know, as we're getting to release date, any, anything you remember about the big premiere at the Cannes Film Festival? We were fortunate to have won the Grand Jury Prize at mm. the Cannes Film Festival. So my partner, Gil Friesen, we went to the Cannes Film Festival and we went to the Hotel du Cap to check in in Nice. And we were now sort of thought we were big shots. Gil was the president of a and Records, and I was making all these movies, and we were pretty proud of ourselves. And we walked to check in at the Hotel du Cap, and they say to us, we only take cash. And Gil and I are, huh? And then I hear in the back this roaring voice saying, I got this. And a guy walks up to the front of the counter, takes $1,500 out of his pocket, slams it on the desk, and says, there, you're good. And that man was Jerry Weintraub, who produced all the Oceans movies, and we knew him because he managed the Carpenters. Hmm. So he, he kind of <laughs> saved us that day. But the great thing about going to the premiere of a movie at Cannes, it's, they are so respectful of the audience. The way it works is the filmmakers and producers and everything, they waited in a room outside and then all the lights are dimmed. And then you're asked to walk in and there's a spotlight following you to where you sit down. And it's just the most respectful experience. I'll never forget it. But this was quite an achievement for you guys. And when I look at my pop culture 80s timeline, I see a movie called The Breakfast Club came out about seven weeks later from Birdie. And that's the second A&M film. We're not going to talk about that really here today because we did two different podcasts on The Breakfast Club, the making of it, and how you first met John Hughes and gave him the first opportunity to direct a film. You're the first person to have done that for him. And then we talked about the making of the movie and its legacy. And if you have not heard those podcasts as part of the Hot Pie Package, you definitely need to check those out. Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. So The Breakfast Club now is really the first big hit for A&M Films. And there's another movie that comes out in 1985, just rolling along with you guys, just churning out the good stuff, is a really awesome comedy called Better Off Dead, starring John Cusack. Tell me your thoughts and your memories on how that happened. Well, this is an inspiring story for all young filmmakers. Somehow I got a VHS tape and I looked at it and it was just the funniest short film I'd seen. And it was called My 11-Year-Old Birthday Party. Mm -hmm. It was in black and white. It was about this father who wants to give his kid the greatest birthday party ever. And anything that could go wrong goes wrong. Like the clown arrives and he's drunk and 
the brakes go out on a car and it runs into the girl. It's just a mess, but it was really funny. So I found who made it. His name was actually, this is the name that he always uses, Savage Steve Holland. He's like this nice, quiet little guy, and he calls himself Savage. Anyway, he was an animation major. He had just graduated from Caltech. And I found him, and I said, do you have anything else? He said, yeah, I have a script. It's called Better Off Dead. I said, can I read it? He said, sure. And I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was really funny. Again, like the John Hughes situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He said, I have to direct. I said, okay, obviously I have a thing for first time directors. That's my jam. And it took me almost two years to find somebody to finance this movie. It was like $2 million, you know, to convince somebody to let an animation major Mm -hmm. direct a narrative film who had never directed before was kind of a complicated conversation. But I found a very nice man at who's running CBS Films at the time. And he said, we'll put up $2 million. And we started making the movie. And by the way, just after we finished the movie, CBS Films sort of went out of business. So, I mean... I think we were used their last $2 million or something. And we... I uh, want my $2 million. <laughs> yeah. We found uh, John Cusack out of Chicago. Uh -huh. His mother was an agent and he really liked him. We actually had some other auditions. One that was memorable. Robert Downey Jr. came in oh, wow. to audition for the role. And we were sitting there at a casting director. Savage was there and me. He walked in the room. He looked at us. He said, I'm not feeling it. And he left. That's it. It was like the weirdest thing. <laughs> I've, I've never had somebody walk in and just say, not feeling it. That's crazy. Yeah. And I actually knew his father, who was a fabulous oh, filmmaker. Well. Of course, John Cusack has gone on to be a really interesting, you know, dynamic, diverse actor. What was his vibe? Was he just a straight comedy guy at this point? Well, he was just starting out. He was very young. You can tell when you look at the movie. We always had the impression that he'd rather be working with Robert Altman or Steven Spielberg <laughs> or George Lucas and Scorsese <laughs> Scorsese and oh, okay. you know what was he doing on this little comedy you know I mean he was fine uh, he's, he's a smart guy for sure but he always had a look about him that made us feel like he wanted to be somewhere else he is funny as anything in that if he wasn't happy it didn't show because that movie is that movie is hilarious, but that movie is also a real cult classic. I'm not sure it was so big at the box office, but I know that movie has made a major impact in the decades to come from a cult standpoint. We have shown the movie a lot. Like at midnight in, in Pasadena, we've done it a few times. Like the Rocky Horror Show. And uh -huh. people will yell back at the screen and say, I want my $2 if anybody knows the movie. <laughs> I want my $2! So it has become kind of a cult classic. And when we finished making it, the people at Warner Brothers thought Savage was going to be the next John Hughes. Mm -hmm. So they wanted him to make a movie for them. And they said, Better Off Dead cost $2 million. And then the studio made the big mistake that kind of happens with the sophomore film. One reason why I work with first-time directors so much is they are so passionate so devoted. They know if they screw it up, they'll never work again. Mm -hmm. Then if they make their first movie, it's, it's like somebody who writes a first book or right. first album. You know, if they have some success, you know, they have more of a comfort zone. So Warner Brothers gave S Savage $12 million to make a movie which became One Crazy Summer with John Cusack being dragged on onto the set, basically. Mm. <laughs> Savage really wanted him. Quite honestly, Savage got really good performances out of John Cusack. You and Savage Steve, though, you guys stayed in touch over the years, you said. We have been in touch all the time. Holidays. He's just a fantastic guy. And we always had a good time together. And maybe I'll do a podcast with him. <laughs> well, he moved on to TV. And he definitely has done a lot since these films. So that's great. I also love that he's this animation major that you, you know, discovered. I remember those movies had really clever animations. Like the intro, you know, the opening sequence was animated. You didn't see that much then. So I thought that was cool that you guys tied in his skill and interest. And in One Crazy Summer, Cusack is a sketch artist that becomes animated. So, yeah, 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 totally. So we found another way to do that. I'm proud of those films. I love comedy. And one of them has held up for a long time. So another A&M movie from about the same time that I want to ask you about is Bring on the Night which is starring Sting after he left the police. And what's cool about this is it seems like it's the perfect mix of A&M films with A&M records. 
Well, as you know, the police were one of A&M's biggest acts for years. And when they broke up, Sting wanted to have his own career, you know, as a solo artist, and we supported him 100%. And he was putting a new band together, but he didn't want to do a music video about it. He wanted to make a film. And he came to us, you know, me, A&M Films, and guilt reason. And he said, I want to make a movie about this. How, how can I do that? And we said, give us a little time. We'll see what we can come up with. And we met with some directors and a fabulous director named Michael Apted. He directed a Bond movie. He was a famous documentary filmmaker. And we came up with the idea together that it would be really interesting to show the making of a band. There are a lot of movies about the breaking up of a band, but we hadn't at that time found one of how a band comes together, musically, personally, culturally. And so we hired Michael Apted to make a film about Sting putting in a new band together. And this was a different type of band, too. I know this is very different than uh, Andy Summers and Stuart Copeland, the guys he's playing with in this. He went in a totally different direction. He hired the guys from Weather Report, great jazz musicians, totally different than Sting and the way Sting usually performs and sings. And the question was, could they come together? And because it was a film, we decided to shoot it in Paris at a beautiful theater and really make it something special. In jazz, a soloist is allowed maybe three or four verses to warm up his solo, to, to, so he makes this organic curve. And he's allowed to, to wander around and, and find this avenue and, and, and jettison that and go somewhere else. In rock music, you have to burn from the first so with you basically making this documentary of, of Sting's new band and this, and this new album, I guess, tell me if I'm wrong, but I guess you're a little less stressed out about whether this movie's going to be a hit per se, like a you know, Hollywood hit, because you probably have this amazing soundtrack that's right in your hands. Well, we committed a million dollars to the movie, and you're absolutely right, because we knew even if the movie didn't do anything, we would get our money back from the soundtrack. But it wasn't a very risky bet. And the other thing we knew was to keep Sting happy. You know, there's, there's two <laughs> yeah. things that are important. One is making money, the other is keeping Sting happy. And, and this makes <laughs> Sting happy, and if he's happy, we're happy. So it was the easiest call of all the movies we were involved in. And were you on set for all the taping of all the concert performances? I was, and we also filmed their rehearsals. Let me explain how it all kind of worked. We rented this huge castle, historic castle outside of Paris, and everybody lived there and the band rehearsed there. And the only way we could get this culturally important French castle was to allow the tours to go through any time they wanted. So in the film, while the band is playing this jazzy hot number, a tour arrives of people who are like in their 70s and 80s <laughs> in wheelchairs and canes with their hands over their ears walking through the castle. And, and that's in the movie. Then we, for five days, filmed in a beautiful theater in Paris, in downtown Paris. And we got the production designer, Fernando Scarfiati, who designed movies like The Last Emperor, I mean, he's one of the great wow. classic production designers. So the theater looks great. And if you look at the movie, it's, it's a dream kind of set for a rock and roll band. And we filmed five nights with cameras everywhere because Apted was a documentary filmmaker. So we really covered that place. And the film is really a mix of the concert stuff with the rehearsal to get there, which I think it looked, it looked great. I think it's very cool. Yeah, the structure of this kind of movie is you tease the audience in the rehearsal with part of a song. And then in the second half of the movie, you give them the entire song in the theater. Right. So, you, nice. so you're going back and forth from the castle to the theater, and then you're in the theater for the whole end of the movie. Right. And this became a live album separately, just bring on the night of the same name. And then actually I heard a lot of the original songs from the film, some of them ended up on Dream of the Blue Turtles, you know, his Correct. next album. But there's also something in the movie that struck me that's not quite on stage concert or rehearsal. It was something a little more personal, right? In Sting's world. Well, Sting had his wife, Trudy, with him, who was very, very pregnant. And we were all betting on if she was going to have her baby during the filming. And in fact, she does. And because Michael Apted is a documentary filmmaker, we really filmed that birth. You, you got the full birth footage from <laughs> Michael Apted in that hospital room in the middle of a rock and roll movie and Sting liked it, Michael Apted liked it, and we weren't going to tell him 
it doesn't really work. But I mean, who would say no to Sting? I mean, we, we couldn't say no to him. And so it's, it's in the movie. So you got the birth of his new band and, and the birth of his new baby. <laughs> it worked out. And somebody won money for which day she had the baby because there were bets all over the place. Oh, that's funny. The movie won a Grammy and I assume it did fairly well at the box office because Sting still is, but was such a huge artist then. So for you, how cool was that to sort of be in his orbit? Were you friends from before when he was on A&M or did you get to know him better now? When he was with the police, you know, I, I knew them and, and I knew Stuart Copeland. The interesting thing about Stuart Copeland is his brother, Miles Copeland, is mm-hmm. the manager of the police and he started IRS records which A&M distributed also we sort of come full circle with getting the best of all the worlds IRS the police sting the movie the soundtrack you know for a million dollars it was a really good play sounds like a win the next movie in the Andy Meyer timeline which I want to ask you about, a movie called Promised Land in 1987. And I think at this point, you moved on. And if I'm not mistaken, now you're the president of Wildwood Enterprises, which is Robert Redford's new company. And now this is the first movie you're doing with him. Correct. I was now running Redford's company. And we were very much, of course, involved in the Sundance Lab, which was a writer's lab they have in the summer, which is a really cool deal, in which if you're picked, you come out and and all these well-known writers and directors work with you on your screenplay and help you develop it. And it's quite an honor. And there was a writer director there named Michael Hoffman, who's gone on to do The Last Station and Soap Dish and a lot of big movies. And he had a small script called Promised Land. And Redford really liked him. And we committed to making the movie. We didn't put the money up, but we were committed to finding the money, which we did. And we started production. And this movie is a little different than maybe some of the other things you had executive produced. This is more of a gritty drama. So what were some of the challenges making this film? We shot it in Utah on the Utah Salt Flats. But the biggest problem we had was the money fell out 48 hours before we were supposed to shoot. And I had the distinction of having to fly to Salt Lake and tell the crew we had just lost the money. And and they were like, oh, man. (laughs) How much money are we talking, if you don't mind me asking? (laughs) It was $5 million. Wow. And so I had to, in 48 hours, find a replacement of that money, which I did. And we were able to make the movie. But it was a kind of... I don't want to do that again. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. How, how does somebody just find find five million dollars in two days? I can't even find five hundred bucks for my Con Ed bill tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you do that? I called a friend of mine who's running another company, and and they committed to it. You know, Redford was involved, and we were looking at some interesting talent as well. And so, Promised Land stars Meg Ryan and Kiefer Sutherland, who are both kind of also right on the cusp of breaking big. What are your memories of either them being cast or working with them on set at all? I think Redford had a lot to do with getting them, and he was very Mm -hmm. much involved in that aspect of the movie. They were both really smart, and, you know, they were involved in some of the dialogue work, and it was a little movie that we shot pretty fast because there wasn't a lot of money, and they were pros, and they went on to do, obviously, a lot of big movies, and this was one of their sort of entry-level films to start their career. So this movie was more of a critical success than perhaps a commercial one. It was a small production in the world of Robert Redford, who was looking to direct his own stuff, who was acting. This movie was not the only focus of his life. So the fact that it got some good reviews, we didn't have any money in it. It was fine. Now, had you gotten Meg Ryan post when Harry met Sally, you know, maybe this would be a different story. Yeah. You never know. I I wish. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Now, you stayed, of course, working with Robert Redford at Wildwood, and you were a big part of the next film that he did, which was the Milagro Beanfield War the year later. This is an example, and I learned from this, of how you have to be really committed to material for it to ever happen or succeed. Because Bob, everybody calls him Bob. So uh, Bob had acquired this book by John Nichols, a famous book in New Mexico called The Milagro Beanfield War. And he spent years trying to develop it. It was very tricky getting the sort of spiritual side of it right. That's a hard angle to to do correctly. Mm -hmm. And he went through four or five writers. He finally ended up with David Ward, David Ward, who had written The Sting, starring Mm -hmm. Paul Newman, Robert Redford. And they got to a place where there was a shooting script. This was Redford's homage to his Sundance Film Festival. He wanted this to be a little independent film, as opposed to all the big Hollywood films he always did. And his love was always with, obviously with the festival, for smaller 
indie films. And so we started out, we had some trouble getting the lead. It took a long time and Redford was conflicted about that, but he put a terrific cast together of Daniel Stern and Ruben Blades and Christopher Walken and just really a terrific cast. And we started making the movie, but for reasons that had nothing to do with Redford, it's almost impossible to say we're making a little independent film and have a studio finance it because I would call up actors and Redford only want, wanted to work with the best people. And I'd say, well, look, this is just a little indie film. You're, you're going to have to cut your fee. And they all said, we're not cutting our fee. Universal's financing this movie. Don't pretend you're a little independent film. So we started to go a little over budget and Universal got kind of nervous about that. And there's this one scene I'll always remember because it's, it's so typical of who Redford is and what a persuasive, charming, smart guy he is. The Universal people said, you guys are starting to go over budget. We're coming out to talk to you and see what we can do about bringing the cost of the movie down. So they fly, they fly to Salt Lake and then they fly in a helicopter up to Sundance, which is in the mountains. I see the helicopter land and I go, huh, how's that going to reduce our budget? They're going to charge that helicopter <laughs> against our movie. So these guys come in, they've got these accordion fold-out accounting sheets, and by the end of the meeting, Bob had gotten all the money he needed for the movie and more, and a big donation to the Sundance Institute. He <laughs> was so charming and persuasive, he got everything he wanted, and those guys just gave him whatever he wanted, and they went back. So now it's 1989, and I'm jumping to another great part of your career where you were running Norman Lear's company, Act Three Productions. And I think the first movie Act Three did was a Burt Reynolds movie called Breaking In in 1989. That was a John Sayles script, which I liked. And John Sayles had done a lot of serious movies, Return of the Secaucus Seven and things like that. And he wanted to write a comedy. And this was sort of a comedic kind of buddy movie. And there was an interesting director named Bill Forsyth attached who had made one film that I liked. And we bought the script and we got Burt Reynolds to star in it, which was kind of a big deal because it was a $5 million sure. movie. And he liked it. And it was going to be his first like serious movie, like maybe get an Oscar nomination kind of movie as opposed to Smokey and the Bandit and stuff like that. This movie, by the way, I mean, it's not a great story, but it is the best reviewed movie of all my movies. It is 90% liked in Rotten Tomatoes because the critics just love that he was trying to do something serious. He walked with a limp, which they thought was really cool, which I actually never understood why that was so cool. And we made the movie, but there was a conflict between the studio that thought they were making a kind of old style buddy comedy movie and the director who was very quiet, but we soon discovered was doing a kind of mentor, adapt and survive, teach a young kid how to grow up which is much different than what the studio thought. And we had a big conflict at the end of the movie. At the end of the movie, the studio wanted a bunch of changes. And Bill Forsyth and I were in the screening room watching the movie. And at the end of the movie, it froze. And I said to the director, Bill Forsyth, so these are all the changes uh, we want you to do. And Bill Forsyth stood up, dramatically walked up to the screen, pointed to the screen and said, this is my painting. I have finished my painting. I am going home. I said, fine. He went home and we made all the changes without him. So you brought your own paintbrush, changed the picture a little bit. Would you ever have known if he cared about the changes you made after? Or? We have never spoken since and probably never will. It was not a good ending, let's just say that. <laughs> but he did give you that quote. It's a great one. But yeah, I got the line. So it was worth it. I think this was one of those movies where not a lot of people saw it, but critics did love it. 90%. It's unbelievable on Rotten Tomatoes. So go figure. So, so you're telling me Rotten Tomatoes has a lower score on Breakfast Club and Better Off Dead than Breaking In? That's the truth. It's strange, but I believe you. Also, when you were running Norman Lear's company, the next big movie you did, which really turned out to be quite a success, was Fried Green Tomatoes. So just like The Breakfast Club, we're not going to spend time chatting about that film here because there is a whole other podcast we did dedicated to the making of Fried Green Tomatoes. And I urge you to check that out because that was a really, really fun conversation and a wild story how that 
movie went from almost never happening to becoming, you know, an Oscar nominated film. It was a five year journey and the hardest thing I ever had to do to get it financed, made. So I'm proud of it. And I'd love for everybody to hear the podcast. Secrets in the sauce. So, so I've been told. We talk a lot about life lessons. And I know the book you're writing also entitled The Meyer Chronicles. We'll probably touch on this type of stuff more, but I think with Fried Green, it sounded like, from our conversation in the other podcast, it sounded like with Fried Green that you learned a lesson about sticking with something even when everyone else says it's not going to work. And at the end of the day, there's validation there if you really believe in it. Yes, and also you need a bit of luck. If you remember in the podcast, (laughs) you know, you can make all the right moves, do all the traditional things, but every now and then you, you need a little angel dust on your shoulders. And Fry Green had that, and otherwise, I don't know if we could have made the movie. Nice. But So also in 1991 is a comedy romance starring Kevin Bacon and Kira Sedgwick called Pirates. I like to brag when I know everything about a movie, and this is actually a movie that I, I can't say I ever heard about. Is there something you can tell me about this movie with a great cast, Pirates from 1991? I wanted to mention this movie on our show as a thank you to Kevin Bacon and Kira Sedgwick. This is a very small movie. Not many people saw it, but they were the most professional people I've ever worked with in my life. They came at nine o'clock. They hit their marks. They didn't complain. They knew they weren't making The Godfather. They left (laughs) at five, and they did that every day for a month. And I couldn't be more grateful to them and respectful of them. And for that reason, I mentioned this movie. When it was done and if somebody had a note for them, they didn't say, well, I just did my role and that's my painting and I am done. (laughs) No, it was the opposite of that. They were collaborative. Oh, that's cool. Kevin Bacon's awesome. I mean, and they were husband and wife at that time or maybe just, that's cool. They were. I've noticed a lot of your movies, Andy, are based on books. They're adapted, their screenplays adapted from books and they're not easy books necessarily. What is it about you or your background or your, your inclinations or your preferences that you have found yourself going down this road multiple times? Birdie, Fried Green, that movie Midnight Clear with Ethan Hawke. What is it about a book that always seems to grab you first? Well, maybe it's the English major in me, but I always found that if you have a book, when you're meeting with a writer, you have a common ground that you can always go back to. That's true. A lot of movies are made because somebody walks in and pitches an idea and you buy the idea. But when you get the script at the end of six weeks or whatever it is, you say, that isn't really the pitch (laughs) that I bought. This seems like a whole different kind of story. And there's no foundation for you to discuss it from. So I thought it made it much easier for everybody, the studio, the writers, me, if there was an underlying foundation of content that we all agreed on initially and started to work from there. And in the past couple of decades, uh, when you've been doing other things as well, are you still reading books where you say, oh, that's going to be a great movie? And are you still thinking in that way and looking for more ideas? I'm constantly developing all kinds of things from books, from pitches. None of that has changed. It's sort of my DNA, I think. Another theme that I'm seeing here is that you're either a very generous guy or you become fast friends with guys who want to direct but haven't directed yet before. (laughs) So you're giving them these great opportunities, first time directors. Has that proven to be harder for you or is there some sort of magic in that? It wasn't by design, Mm -hmm. but when a first time director come into my office, they have a passion and a desire. Otherwise, they wouldn't dare come into my office if they didn't feel like they could do it. And so what I respond to is in all the cases of these first time directors, their skill set and their desire and how driven they are. And you don't call them right all the time, but with these films you're talking about, I made the right bet and I'm proud of how they all came out. Yep, absolutely. And I'm sure a lot of these guys look back and think, wow, Andy Meyer from A&M Films or Andy Meyer with Act 3, he gave me my first break. Everyone needs that first break, you know? You know, I was happy to do it and it worked out well for them and for me. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so, and, and for the company. So aside from um, you and I going to see Better Off Dead at the Midnight Theater, hopefully one day soon, what, uh, <laughs> what's your day-to-day like now? And what are you doing these days as it connects to Hollywood and filmmaking? Well, I'm always developing ideas and pitches and looking at books, but I spend a lot of my time kind of mentoring and as a professor at the Savannah College of Art and Design. And a lot of my book is about teachable moments 
<laughs> and a lot of those come from lectures that I do at the college. So it's a nice kind of mixing in of working with young people who help me stay young and introduce me to things and discover new ideas and passing along. I mean, part of what this book is, it's kind of a legacy book. I feel like the elders, not to get all historical on you, the elders have an obligation to pass along what they've learned to the next generation. And that's what I'm trying to do with this book. And I remember when we talked about the making of The Breakfast Club, that you would go around the world with SCAD and you would see that this movie and other movies you'd made had been seen around the world in other countries and other languages. And these movies were resonating internationally. And that's a big thing. I found it amazing that when I went to Rio de Janeiro, I screened a version of The Breakfast Club with Portuguese subtitles. When I went to Beijing, the kids there knew about The Breakfast Club. I was astounded. It feels good. Well, this has been great. Another great conversation with you, Andy. And I really love all the stuff that we covered here in your time as an executive producer of so many great films and telling all of our viewers all these cool things that they would not have known about before. Well, thank you for your patience, your diligence. This has been fun. Hopefully we'll do more. And uh, hopefully I'll have a book out and let's just keep going. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Meyer Chronicles. And thank you for listening. To hear more episodes in this series, go to hotpiemedia.com.